Now in the next session might be talk to the city how large language model can help discriminate consensus illusion. And they say with talk to the city, AI objectives um, incentives, but it's that democratic deliberation, a process and poet. Ah, now you are. Maybe you can do introduction yourself, right? Okay. Fabulous. And also, um, there's slider on, on the board, so you can see um, if you want to have any question to the talk to the city. Hi everyone, my name is Dayar Turan. Um, I am with AI Objectives Institute and with Metaculus. And I'm excited to talk about processes that um, bring us towards better or worse policy outcomes. And especially asking the question of consensus and whether or not consensus brings us towards good in a reliable fashion. Um, I would love to, can you help for one second? Oh, there we are, okay, browser over there. Cool, let's start with a simple question. I would like you all to answer this out loud. Um, let's imagine we have 100 million to improve the state of our community. What are policies that you think everyone in this room would be agreeing upon? I'd love to hear a couple suggestions. Yeah. Quick thoughts that come to mind. Right, say there's plenty of budget, what do we do? Any suggestions that you think will have widespread agreement among folks in this room? Grant for community infrastructure. Any other thoughts on where we go? Yeah, <laughs> that sounds good. Right. Um, it is, in fact, quite difficult to think about flows that will reliably get us towards consensus agreement. Um, one of the questions that we've been thinking about is with respect to language models being trained and developed, what are ways in which these will intersect with the drive towards consensus that a lot of current political structures abide by? Um, say we're dealing with a simple question on how can we improve pedestrian and bike safety in high traffic areas. The question on should we reduce speed limits, can we add dedicated bike lanes, these seem to be easy conclusions that one could get to by assuming, well, everyone would like more bike lanes, bikes seem to be quite good in general, let's draft a conversation to go more towards there. And then you see, well, actually these are, while easy to reach, a consensus statement that a lot of people would say, yeah, thumbs up, that is good. In actual implementation, um, which are the streets that are going to be narrowed further down to add the bike lanes actually ends up bringing a level of complication. But if you want to just stay with consensus, obviously adding more dedicated bike lanes is a great thing to do. We don't want to go into the details of which streets we will be narrowing down further and further. Um, this is a system that actually is fairly active both in how we are training language models but also how we are doing politics today. So um, there's a paper that came out of DeepMind in uh, 2012 um, on finding agreement among humans with diverse preferences. And it is interesting for, it really showcased, in my opinion, a conclusion that is quite important, which is LLMs are pretty good at finding the statements that are most agreeable, such as, you know, let's have more bike lanes, more bike lanes are good. More bike lanes being good doesn't necessarily cover the details of which streets we are going to be narrowing down to have more bike lanes. And um, what is most agreeable is not necessarily good policy. And seems like a lot of ways in which we are doing RLHF, uh, reinforcement learning for language model training, really prioritizes agreeable behavior. How can we have a statement that is least offensive, that will give thumbs up for the largest number of people? And this actually causes a lot of lukewarm conclusions that are not necessarily good policy. Now, we're talking about this in the context of training an AI model, but the same phenomenon actually happens with um, politics that is happening as of today. Um, consensus is power, especially in a democratically elected system, which causes every group to start making concessions to about, you know, instead of staying very high fidelity to the specific narrow view that you have, um, obviously, in order to build coalition, you might need to make compromises. These compromises stacking on top of each other can 
often yields less and less fidelity to the original cause that you've started with. Um, if we are existing in a system that highly power, values power rather than fidelity to your cause, if the system cannot actually accommodate multiple different perspectives and asks them to go towards more lukewarm solution, then what happens is a phenomenon that we can observe in a lot of different um, democratic states where the higher specificity, this often happens with more liberal parties that seek further specificity and conservative parties seeking more about generalizable, more um, opinion-based, but not necessarily specific to policy vibes that end up causing political fragmentation on one side of the spectrum and political coalition on another side of the spectrum. This actually yields outcomes that are highly non-specific towards policy. And um, this ambiguity being further rewarded, such as you know, visions of you know, nationalist values or visions of civic improvement rather than what is the actual thing we can do. Um, instead of a power system that highly values and rewards consensus, can we go through as a flow that actually creates shared world models across people that can accommodate these differences? I want to start with a couple questions on trying to develop good policy um, are we able to incentivize contributions to policy creation that look at different aspects of the question, such as what kinds of futures do we want to live in? What are the qualities of these futures? Are the causes that we are looking at prioritized correctly to move towards these futures? And are there positive sum games in this journey? Um, there will be externalities. I would love to only say we need more bike lanes where everyone would agree rather than you know, commenting on these are the roads that we need to shrink and say you know, the folks that are living in those neighborhoods be upset. But which policies will be shouldered, uh, which policies will cause the externalities and to whom is this cost? And are we able to create a context in which people can express these disagreements where the disagreements inherently are being talked about? So, there's a couple different ways in which I have seen disagreements in policymaking. The first one I want to explore is a good crux, where two people have a disagreement. I think A is true or I think A is false. And then we say, OK, can we actually find a shared world model in which this disagreement can be housed? Which is, if I thought B was false, I would change my mind about A. If I thought B was true, I would change my mind about A. We realize there's an underlying cause here that if these two people say, let's actually look at the source and find out that if we are actually in agreement about the deeper issue, then the policy on whether or not we should move forward with A or we shouldn't move forward with A, we would be able to reach agreement. So if B, the underlying cause, is something that is measurable and testable, what we can have is these two people to say, we are actually in agreement that we need to figure out B and depending on B's results, we will be able to align on whether or not we want to move forward with A. There's a lot of policies that are being made heavily on assumptions of underlying causes. And the current political system tries to only debate the higher level without necessarily saying what is clearly necessary is for this group to change their opinions to go towards a yes or a no on this issue. This is the underlying assumption that needs to be tested. Then there's the opposite of this, which I call a risky alliance, where two people seemingly agree on A. Policy A is good. But A is good because it will enable B, which will also be great. While the other person might say, well, I actually don't think B is a good path forward. We are not actually in agreement about the world model. Now, this kind of risky alliances are also fairly common in political scene, where the short-term goal seems to be in alignment, so this forms a coalition. These coalitions are extremely brittle, in fact. We've seen this a lot with respect to development of safe AI or plurality. Um, these kinds of frameworks where two groups are seemingly in agreement in order to reach a small goal, but not necessarily about the underlying reasons, is actually quite risky as well. And again, if we are only operating on a democratically vote-oriented political system that is looking at the surface policy, sure, these two people will agree with each other. And say, you know, we are in a situation where we're debating, should we plant more carrots or should we plant more corn? And for some reason, the carrot people are agreeing with, say, you know, having more solar power and self-driving cars because that coalition seems to be able to bring a better outcome. Meanwhile, you know, the people that are saying we should plant more corn realize, oh, maybe then I should be against going with solar energy because seemingly there's a coalition forming over there. This basically is the case of losing fidelity to the cause that we're talking about. 
Now, I see this as three main pillars that we can actually use the power of plurality rather than look at just pure consensus when we are thinking about what are the right uh, processes we can look towards collective intelligence and how would this be able to bring us value. There's three pillars here that we need to talk about. The first one is asking the citizens, asking all of the stakeholders, what are the future desirable states? What is the world that we want to live in? Then this information feeds directly into the policymakers whose responsibility is what are the action courses that are ahead of us? Which policy can we pass? Which levers can we pull given the constraints we have on budget? This information also feeds to the third pillar, which is the outcome likelihood. This can be domain experts that are saying, okay, given these actions, these are the likely consequences of these actions. These three pillars in, say, you know, a small you know, nonprofit can all be the same people. When you're looking at an entire nation, these can be completely decoupled different parts of you know, the institution of the government. Um, I find there to be a lot of value for these to be analyzed as independent questions. And when we are talking about voting over a policy, these naturally get entangled in a way that causes a lot of risky alliances to be formed, a lot of more vibe-based decision-making to happen rather than actually looking at what's the core heart of the issue at hand. Um, more bike lanes is great, but what are the roads that can we shrink? What are the likely consequences of these? Do we like those consequences? And this feedback loop continuing further and further. Um, I am quite interested in exploring these as three different pillars that can actually bring a plurality of different tooling, especially on civic tech uh, side. That doesn't necessarily only rely on governments to install new uh, processes, but also for any organization to be able to prototype and test these forward. So I will talk about uh, Talk to the City, which is a tool that we have developed with AI Objectives Institute. Um, the core goal of this tool is to identify the diversity of desirabilities that exist in a very large uh, community. Um, would you be able to help on trying to go to the, um, the demo sheets here? I don't know where the screen went. Oh, all right, I got it. I can. Let's um, start from here. So um, Talk to the City is a large language model based tool whose goal is to be able to aggregate diverse points of view from a large body of contributors. These can be coming in, for, in the form of raw text. This can be coming in in form of a video or an audio snippet to be able to consolidate it into many different viewpoints that exist in this body of text. Its goal is not to necessarily identify clusters of humans that agree on topics, which I think is quite important at this stage. Instead of using recommender systems like uh, workflow to identify what are the similar uh, communities, um, I'm going to switch to English and back and forth to show um, we can translate the body of the text that we have collected. Um, so this was one of the examples uh, that we have done in uh, Taiwan. Um, Zoe Tseng, maybe some of you know her, has been pushing forward this project uh, with AI Assembly. Um, uh, I find this to be quite interesting for its core goal is to be able to house a lot of different viewpoints that have been expressed through um, the AI Assembly deliberation sessions. Um, and some of these topics do have uh, different viewpoints and the language model advantage that we have here is instead of people upvoting or downvoting small snippets with the human bandwidth that is constraining for how much you can see, um, we can lean on language models to identify what are patterns in the data that we're looking at, what are the clusters that emerge from there, and these clusters to be tiered so you can see larger parent categories and zoom into smaller categories where every person doesn't get one vote. You have as many opinions as you wish. You can keep on contributing and have further and further claims that you can add to a data set. And the right way to use this isn't to say, what is the largest data set? What is the most agreed data set? But to identify what are the nuances that exist within uh, the cluster. Say, for example, we're going to impact of AI on careers. There is differing viewpoints that are critical arguments from uh, this body, um, all the way from AI will not replace jobs in our generation to AI will replace jobs in a very short snippet. Now, um, going back to what we were discussing, if we are trying to have a singular language model to try to come up with a conclusion on um, what is the uh, perspective, what is the conclusion, the language model will be forced to give you an answer. 
in trying to give that answer, the language model will naturally have to prune a lot of different perspectives that exist in the community. Because if you prompt a language model and only reward the model for being able to give you the one consensus viewpoint, we will effectively replicate the problem that also exists in our governance structure to say, here is a singular conclusion and uh, we will not be able to accommodate nuance, which is why a language model will say, yes, we need more bike lanes. Maybe we don't need more bike lanes. Maybe we need to really identify what are different viewpoints that exist within the topic. So there's a couple different strategies here. We can use multiple different language models that have different responsibilities on different perspectives, for example. And instead of um, trying to find consensus at, as soon as possible, if we actually stay in the window of what are differing perspectives that exist, we actually will find much more value. Um, if you're interested in looking more into how Talk to the City has been um, built and iterated from our site, definitely recommend you to check ai.objectives.institute. If you go to slash blog, you will see um, this uh, post written by Zoe, Amplifying Voices, Talk to the City in Taiwan. We have a Chinese version of the post and also the data as well. Um, here you will be able to see um, the work that we have done with different data sets. Um, Talk to the City is open source. If you have any large collection of data already, it would be fairly quick to set up a new instance so you can see what are the different viewpoints that exist in this category. Um, and definitely encourage you to come find people from AI Objectives Institute if you're curious to try things together while we're here. Um, so do take a look on this front. Um, going back to the illusion of consensus, rather than pushing towards consensus, if we have frames that you can keep zooming in to identify, you know, what are further similarities, what are further differences, you actually do find, um, which tab was it? Oh, there we are you do find uh, much more nuance in, uh, in the depth of the data set. Um, and the data sets can be as large as um, you can provide. We have tried scaling up to much larger um, comment collections. So um, that will not be a blocker uh, from our side. Um, I do want to go to, so this is an example of future desirability for citizens, where we are able to ask an open-ended question to a wide body of participants. I also do want to talk about action possibilities and outcome likelihood for domain experts. This was something that um, Isabel was recommending me to actually touch on in the, co in the conversation. Um, and their question is around the diverse outcome likelihoods. Are we able to, how do I full screen this? So. It's kind of, is it this? Yeah. Nope. This space? Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, just for. So. Cool. So um, I will touch on work that I am doing with Metaculus, which is a forecasting aggregation platform also on identifying outcome likelihoods that many people are able to point at as these are correct strategies we could take. Forecasting is an interesting toolbox for identifying which policies are actually likely to yield the conclusions we are looking at. So not only asking what future do we want, but also what are the action courses that are likely to bring us the outcomes that we are looking for. One of the interesting aspects of forecasting is being a domain expert doesn't necessarily make you better. And even further, being by yourself really doesn't make you better. One theme that we have reliably found is that the community prediction in aggregation will be much more accurate than any specific domain expert. And a lot of people that do end up you know, focusing on forecasting for a while, the super forecasters will end up having much more accuracy um, by following methodologies that are common in this space, but also doing their own research and looking at the community predictions, then people that are actual domain experts, be it you know, in the intelligence or defense sector. Um, we have identified many pro forecasters through Metaculus that actually got really good at being able to identify what are likely outcomes that are to take place. Um, if you're interested in this, I definitely recommend the book Super Forecasting. And, um, I guess we can find the links afterwards too on um, different strategies with which the information that is already out there is in fact quite rich. And aggregating multiple different perspectives in order to identify what is likely to happen given action course X ends up being much more powerful than just asking this to a policymaker. So this is another avenue in which instead of trying to identify consensus, the plurality of different viewpoints on likelihoods all being synthesized together can actually yield much better policy. 
Um, so yeah, wisdom of the crowd is very much a thing here. And one thing I would love to share about is on um, Docket in Metaculus that um, particularly focuses on Taiwan AI and relationship of uh, mainland China and uh, the United States in the context of particularly TSMC and AI development. Um, we have a project called, oops, sorry, have a project called the uh, Project Taiwan Tinderbox, uh, which is a series of questions that is um, supposed to be the starting point on uh, US-China tensions and particularly focusing on Taiwan. And one of the things that I have found interesting is this is a fairly new project, by the way, on Metacus. There is actually a lot of older projects that have pretty much concluded for the windows that they are trying to forecast have already happened. So there is already quite a bit of uh, muscle memory for the forecasting community to look at specific issues at hand. Um, here the core focus is um, what is the relationship of mainland China and the consequences towards AI and um, like current state of production. Um, one of the things that I do find quite interesting here is the larger the body of the comments and the contributors of the forecasts, the more accurate they have gotten throughout the past. And this is a new docket that has been launched. One of the things I would be very interested in is to see actually more participation from Taiwan, the ground, for a lot of the contributors are actually based in Europe and the US. And I think it actually would be quite interesting for some of the you know, hard questions to uh, focus on, um, to actually incorporate information and perspectives from the locals as well. Because I do see this as another case where the consensus perception can actually be much more dangerous rather than actually asking every single human in this community what do you think is likely to happen? What can we do about it? And the aggregation of those historically has always been much more accurate. It's very hard to beat the community prediction itself. Um, there are some pro forecasters that end up doing much better than just the community prediction. But still, the fact that we're able to aggregate the collective to be able to get to highly accurate forecasts into the future is really powerful. So um, if you are interested, definitely recommend you to check out um, attackus.com slash project. You can find much more work on this space too. Um, these are two examples where I see the um, wisdom of the crowd can really actually amplify quality policy making. I'm quite interested in ways in which these can be integrated into existing political structures as well. But I'm also very ex excited about them to be able to make impact without necessarily being integrated into existing policy structures. For example, a lot of forecasts from Metaculus have heavily guided a lot of philanthropic donations with respect to what are the cause priorities. So if it is too slow to work with government, and I'm sure folks here are familiar with this spirit, let's actually demonstrate that this is possible and move forward at a pace that we can actually address to the concerns that we have in the world. So I, with that said, I think I'll open to questions and more discussions about both of these strategies. So yeah, thank you for listening. Hi, uh, thank you for the great speech. What I am wondering with aggregating uh, the public's comments with large language models is that I think it's there, we face a risk of these language models abstracting the context from a certain uh, point of view or a certain discussion and resulting in otherwise absurd or misrepresented views from the public. What do you think we can do in trying to enhance the fidelity or accuracy of these language models representations? Thank you. Um, I would love to show an example, actually. Do you mind if it can help me <laughs> on uh, switching to the English keyboard? So this is, a, this is actually one of the main uh, concerns that got us started to working on uh, uh, this project. So great question. I do find uh, language models to be getting better and better. Even a few years ago, I would not have trusted a language model to be able to distill you know, policy in any way or shape meaningful. And now I do see it as, if it's actually worded well, it seems to be doing kind of okay. And I think the core question we have is, how quickly can we go to the original source material? If the language model's representation is there, 
but you have a right to not trust the language model. But with one click, if you're able to go to the original source of the content, that's when this becomes really powerful. I would love to show this. For example, this is another study that we have from uh, AI Objectives um, on called, uh, with a group called Heal Michigan that specifically focuses on a community of um, uh, previously incarcerated folks in uh, Detroit. Um, this is a community that really has not been much represented in the US. And what we wanted to offer them here is, are we able to bring their voice to a much larger audience by giving them the support of Talk to the City? Um, so the Heal Michigan report from Talk to the City is a very similar interface. But instead of the raw data coming from text, it actually comes from video snippets from the people. So if you're looking at the core question is, how can your community be supported? Um, so if you look at systemic issues, for example, um, with one click, you are able to go to a specific video in which the person mentioned the opinion. So with one click, if I play it, you can see the raw quote and the original source where she can, she's making a claim. And then you see what is the claim that the language model extracted from this. Now, in today's world, I don't expect the entire democratic infrastructure of a government to be replaced with people sending videos. With that said, being able to make this level of information contribution more mainstream, and this report being taken into account by you know, a politician or a funder, actually showcases that we are able to go to the raw information. And language models can be very helpful here. And this is the role that I would see language models to be transformative. Another aspect is they can integrate multiple different languages. Um, so there is a lot of capabilities that we get that are actually quite powerful. Let's go to other questions. Yeah. Uh, hi, this is Hani, and thank you for sharing. I have two questions, and the first question is about, uh, as you mentioned, uh, you open source the data set uh, of the, 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 the tools, and uh, does your organization open source the which kind, uh, which one model you use to do the cluster things as well, so we can make sure that about mm -hmm. how you cluster. And the second question is about uh, what kind of the biggest challenge as a nonprofit organization uh, face right now because, um, for example, if we want to do this kind of a project like Talk to City, uh, maybe we can have, uh, we, we don't have enough resource or budget to hire the local annotator to mm -hmm. optimize or fine tune the model. Right. So yeah, so that's the second question. Great questions. Um, with respect to the tech, the the code base is open source. You can find it on GitHub. The language model, we don't have a language model. We can plug in many different language models to the system. So using standard models from OpenAI or Anthropic, these are available. But you can also go with an open source model. So in the Taiwan case, for example, we did try a model that Audrey Tang shared with us. Um, I find I am excited about these to be done with language models that are further fine-tuned to the community that it is trying to represent. I think that would be the most ideal. In fact, I do think this tool can be used to be able to aggregate feedback and see ways in which you know, these models can be further brought closer to the causes that uh, they are focusing on. So I actually do find that to be quite a worthwhile project. And if anyone's interested in that project, please come talk to us because I think this is really powerful. Um, for now, for a lot of cases, if you just want to go forward with um, the GPT-4, that probably might get you to where you want to be. But if you say, we don't want our data to be in the hands of another corporation, open source models is the right way to go, for sure. Um, and uh, with respect to the second part of your question, what we are really looking for right now is collaborators. Um, we have this tool. We actually have been incredibly inspired. Like we were talking with Billy yesterday who said that he built a line integration so that people can directly talk to the clusters, um, uh, specifically focusing on the Tainan City Council. And I thought, wow, this is amazing. These are the kinds of you know, enhancements we would love to bring back to the code base and also offer to the wider world. because. So like, Line is common in East Asia. I would love to add a WhatsApp integration, different platforms. So if you're interested in using the tool, um, definitely reach out to us. Um, I think what we need right now is many more case studies to show the world. Um, one more question. Over there. Over there. <laughs> 
Yeah. Yes, uh, benefits for politicians, help them win elections and foster a sense of community. Absolutely, I would love to see more candidates that say, here is my platform, here is what it's backed by. Um, if you want me to change or you know, shift our perspective, send me more information and this is available. I think I would love for more politicians to actually stand up and say, I am representing the community and here is how I am representing, this is picture proof. So that would be very powerful. I'll just touch on the second one too, maybe. Black box nature of LLMs, is it a problem for decision process for reliability and verification? Again, same question. If you're able to go to the source material really easily, that is the right way to go. I would not want to trust just an LLM, but if an LLM helps me get closer to people, then we've done a great job. So, yeah. Thank you all for listening. Yeah.